December 1, 2021, a furious minority group disrupted parliamentary proceedings after the first deputy speaker of parliament, Joseph Osewisu, retorted that he wasn't the speaker of parliament. His pronouncement angered the minority, which led to another commotion. For the second time in the year 2021, parliament was in total disarray. Now came the ultimate of the chaos ever witnessed by the Ghanaian parliament. So this is parliament, members of parliament, of course in a fisticuff with each other. Chaos in the chamber at the moment. There is large chaos. You could see the MPs. This time, the fight and acrimony had reached a crescendo. The MPs were physically at each other's throats, shoving one another and punching the faces of others. Three major disturbing scenes characterized the first year of the Eighth Parliament. But how did we get here? In this documentary, I explore the conduct of the MPs in the Eighth Parliament to establish the benefits or dangers of having a hang parliament. Since the inception of the Fourth Republic, the governing party had always had an overwhelming majority in parliament. But MPs were ushered into the Eighth Parliament with equal numbers and one independent candidate. It's the first time in Ghana's history that the legislature recorded 170 male MPs from both sides and also 20 female MPs from the divide plus an independent MP representing the people of Fomina in the Ashanti region. Some Ghanaians were excited about the current composition of parliament, hoping that it would help the legislature to play its oversight responsibilities and sharpen the country's parliamentary democracy. Ransford Jampo is a political science lecturer at the University of Ghana. If you have parliament and it's always um, one-sided, uh, one side led by majority and you always have minority and the majority will always have its way, then that parliament is deficient or will be deficient in functioning as a countervailing authority to the powers of the executive. When we got to 2020 and we held elections, Ghanaians said enough of um, that kind of parliament. They voted to give us a hung parliament. And um, for me, it is unique to the extent that it's not happened before. It is unique to the extent that now the majority group will not have the political strength or the political muscle to flex. Governments, and it's not particularly peculiar to Ghana, governments, ruling governments have agenda that they pursue. They need to drive the agenda with the approval of the legislature as provided in constitutions the world over. And so if you have the numbers and you are in government, it makes your work easy. If you don't have the numbers, then you have the added task of ensuring that the other side of the divide buys into your agenda and travels with you on the journey that you want to go. So the first head of members of the governing NPP had to cross at the start of the 8th parliament was to get the NDC caucus to back down on its quest to nominate a candidate for the speakership. But according to the minority, the NPP caucus failed to reach out on time. The party had already agreed to nominate Aban Babin as their candidate for the election of the Speaker, when former Speaker of Parliament, Professor Michael Quay, who at the time was still interested in being the Speaker, reached out. But I told him, Prof, you know the difficulty that we have when we try to elect Peter Lajiti. I don't think my party will be willing to go through that path. But if your party can present you, and our party doesn't present a position, because as at that time, my party hadn't taken a decision as to whether we feature a speaker or not. If you can get your party to do this, and then my party doesn't put a candidate on my, on my honor, you can count on me. Then he asks, okay, so what does it take to reach out, uh, and I also added, sorry, 
They are since after the election. Nobody is reaching out from your end. So my party hasn't yet met. We are meeting today to consider what to do. They said, oh, so sure. I said, yes. Okay, so what will be my solution? I said, well, I don't want my issue is the Council of Elders on our side. In my view, if you could talk to uh, Hackman, who is the Council of, uh, Chairman of the Council of Elders, to start talking from the top. If some understanding is rich, that, oh, let's allow the MPP to do their speaker thing, then it becomes easy. But obviously, as a way, I will stand by what my party a minority determined to elect Arban Babin as Speaker of the 8th Parliament began mapping out strategies. The first was to court the support of the independent candidate, Andrew Isiama, of the Fomina constituency. Yeah, and a lot of things happened. What was his reaction? He wanted time to think. And I can tell you one funny thing. I spent more time talking to his wife than himself. As part of my strategy, talking to his wife and telling her what we were ready to offer, if you could come on board and what have you, until the powerful king called him. And then obviously we all respected that king. So, so they were attempt to put him to the side of the NDC? Yes, we did. And I think that we were almost succeeding. Mm -hmm. Then the powerful king called him. And then when he told me, I said, well, this is a king that myself I, I, I revered. So it will not be good to disobey him. But my advice to you is that you know how they treated you. Don't accept anything. If you accept a ministerial position, they will humiliate you. The minority, through its chief whip, Montakamu Barak, also began negotiations with disgruntled NPP and peace to convince them to vote for Urban Babin. Now, we start with 20 numbers. Zero in, zero in, zero in. I mean, to fast track. By the day we were going in, the sixth, I was sure of fact from the, from the majority. Yeah. Five people that virtually like were sworn to each other. Confidentiality, super. And I can tell you, those people that I know, not even my wife that will sleep on the same bed, have I shared this word. Because it was like, if this ever go out, I mean, you, we, I know the consequences. So. And so what helped us most, or what helped me most, was the arrogance of the majority side. They were not written out, they were just taking things for granted, they were assuming that everything is for going. Because whilst I was doing this, I was also auditing my side. Okay. And I knew that there were seven people on my side who also had challenges. What Especially when, when we had settled with, uh, on, on Right Honorable Barbie. Okay. All I kept telling the party was that, look, I'm doing so much work and I'm very confident. So the party that, didn't know that? Because I could not disclose that. It is hereby ordered that James Quaysen, Akaji James J. Chikwesin, first respondent hearing, is hereby restrained from holding himself out as a member of parliament elect. That's the clerk of parliament, Cyril Kobana Insia, on the midnight of 7 January 2021, communicating to the House summons in Junction the Asinod NP, James Quayson, from being sworn into parliament. Their communication generated a lot of debate in the chamber. Just for the records, so that we are all satisfied that you, as a recipient of a court process, cannot have the proof of service. It is held by the bailiff, which is in her administrative records. That is the law. Since you yourself admit that you didn't serve in process, and it is not true that he was in court, we know how he got here. He has not been said. So let him err on the side of caution. As an MP, no, we will not vote. That will not vote. Mister, we will vote today. Mister, that's why you are boring. Sit down, sit down, sit down. You are boring. Sit down. Yes, you mentioned Amewu. Amewu had an injunction. Oh, no. 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 Oh,
of the matter until a court of competent jurisdiction. of the court and in contempt of this house. Mr. Chair, I think that your earlier ruling, you have ruled on this matter, and your earlier ruling stands. If they want to come and challenge it, the rules are clear. Come by a substantive motion. The minority, even before the day, had envisaged the possibility of barring the Asenot NP from participating in the voting and strategize to ensure all their members vote plus the five NPP NPs. As part of this move, the minority set up a 15-member team to realize the vision of the caucus. In my caucus, we call them the bad boys. The bad boys. The bad boys. So it's four objectives. Then, during our meeting, then we got to know that they were targeting the Asin North. Okay. So our first objective is to get the Asin North MP into the chamber to avoid service and get into the chamber would have been served. So it was deliberate? Yes. I mean, it's political strategy. Two, we have to sit on the majority side. Three, we must ensure that there's secret ballot in line with the constitution and standard orders. And four, we must elect the speaker. Papi must be speaker. Because I was hiding him. <laughs> I took seed of him, I took his phone, I put his phone off, I gave him a place where he could do everything, he could be given food and everything, but he's not supposed to be seen by anybody, not even outside. And only those who were in charge, especially the leader of the one who is, was in charge of getting into a chamber, was the only one who knew where he was, and me. That's it. You could be cited for content for obstructing the rule no, of law. No, no, no. Because if a court in Cape Coast mm -hmm. is looking for somebody to serve, they should look for him. The attempt by the clerk of parliament to restrain James Quixin threw the house into total chaos. The clerk was, among other things, accused of bias. His authority to serve the NP elect for Asenop was challenged by the minority, arguing that James Quinson should be allowed to partake in the voting and later face the court if indeed his actions were deemed as contemptuous of court. The debate over the eligibility of the NDC MP traveled for a little over two hours. The NPP MPs who were upset with the development charged the clerk, who obviously was helpless to assume control of the proceedings. The clerk's job that night was to superintend over the election of the speaker, constitute the beginning of the eighth parliament. After hours of struggle, the clerk finally paved the way for the secret ballot elections. A simple exercise to elect the speaker then degenerated into what many described as a shameful conduct by the NPs. <laughs> The first time Ghanaians witnessed total chaos in the chamber. A situation which forced Ghana's military to storm parliament to maintain law and order. One of the protesters of the confusion was Asawasi NP Muntakamuma. My worry with all the people that condemn the violence is that they don't add the source of the problem. But if someone decides, that he is going to put aside our constitution and put aside our standing orders and do as he or she pleases. You should rather be even condemning that one first before you add that. Or even though they did this, maybe you should have used it because I asked somebody. I said, look, I agree. Tell me what we could have done that day. I don't know what we did. Just tell me. But these are a group of people that were bent on putting aside the constitution and standing orders with regard because the constitution is very 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 clear when it comes to putting somebody in office removing someone in office amending the constitution on these three things the constitution says that it should be by secret balloting 
And it's as politically stated when it comes to election of the speaker. Secret ballot. And then someone decides that no, we won't go by that. When you are when you vote, show it to your whip before you go and put it in the ballot box. And the first instance, that was why the first one, if you notice the, 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 the scaffold, the first one, I went to the first MP, tried to take the ballot paper from him. So it became like a personal issue. I had to apologize to that person there and then. Because regardless, I don't have to go try to hold the hand of another MP to try to forcefully collect the DC from him. So I apologize to him with the understanding that we are going to start all over again. And remember, I was the agent for Honorable Babin. And just check the political party, uh, the, electoral, the election at laws. It's clear, when you are an agent, you are supposed to do everything to protect the sanctity of the election. So I'll go to the returning officer, which is the clerk, complain, and he's sitting helpless. That day you notice the videos are there, go and review it. Just check how many times I walked towards him. Just even assume you didn't know what I was telling him. Just check how many times did I walk to the return officer. So look at what they are doing. Me, I'm assuring you, if they don't adhere to the constitutional provision, then we can't have this election. Because the only way we'll have this election is when all of us respect the constitution and standing orders. And the provisions were very, very clear. So, so the second one, when he voted and he still showed, I didn't want the same confrontation the first time. So I had to pick the ballot box to take it to the return officer that look, so long as he has shown it, I'm not going to allow him to put the ballot into the ballot box. But I didn't want to have a fist kind of confrontation with him. So I'm taking the ballot box to say that he won't put it in here. So you, the terms have it until the right thing is done. They won't put it in. Parliament initiated a probe into the actions of the military, which they say flies in the face of democratic tenants. A year down the line, Ghanaians are yet to be briefed on the update of that investigation. Director of Public Affairs in Parliament, Madame Kitado, believes not every issue in Parliament must be made public. Is that it wasn't as if the matter was swept under the carpet. It was actually, uh, you know, spoken about... The public wants to know they are. Uh, uh, um, the the public, if, if there is anything that the public needs to know, Parliament as an institution will make sure that that is done. As of now, what we are seeking to do is to ensure that there is a parliament that is credible, there is a parliament that is, has a positive image in the eyes of right-thinking Ghanaians and reasonable Ghanaians, and that people, you know, irrespective of whatever colors of uh, politics they are wearing, are seeking the utmost interest of the country. And that's what we are all seeking so to do. So you think that what happened on the eve of July 7th, the people who voted their basically into this parliament, I think that um, anything that happens in Parliament ought to be made public because we are representatives of the people. And so if it is in the, it is in the power of Parliament to make it known, Parliament will do that. Yes. You repeat after me. I, I, Alban Sumana, Kingsford Babin. Alban Babin was finally elected Speaker of the House. But the violent scenes and their acrimony broke the trust that exists between the two. The battle lines were drawn, and each caucus devised a strategy to outwit the opponent at every step of the way. The question remained how the two sides of the house were going to work together in a hung parliament. When we talk about a hung parliament, we're talking about a situation where the Parliament is divided into two right down the, the middle. No political, no caucus has a majority. In our case, it is 137, 137, except that one, that other 137 has a plus one. So it's 138 in one caucus against 137 in one caucus. So the 138 constitutes the majority caucus, and to that extent, there is no hung parliament. Where you have a hung parliament, there's no majority leader. They are, then we will refer to them as co-leaders. And that is the concept the speaker wanted to introduce. There's nothing like that in Ghana's parliament. 
That's the majority leader and MP for Swami, Osei Cheme Sabunsu. In sustain, there is no hung parliament. In the seventh parliament, the NPP had an overwhelming majority of 169 MPs, as against the NDC with 106. The game has changed in many respects. And I think people have to adjust to the kind of reality that is being, uh, that is being, being played out. Uh, and also, you know, the fact that given our constitutional arrangements, um, we have ministers who are members of parliament. There is no one single day, if you are not careful, that maybe I mean, important business that would need I mean, numbers to be counted and so on, uh, taking place in the house without some kind of absenteeism because ministers are attending to... And, and also, Parker, you know, we are all human. We've seen people in clutches, I mean, coming to parliament. We've heard about people who have left, I mean, a few days old babies coming to parliament. We've heard about people who were taken from sick beds, I mean, coming to parliament. I think all in the interest of making sure that uh, this is our agenda, the agenda has to pass. It can be done differently, uh, Parker, I believe. And, and it can be done if there's a lot of, you know, working together. I know it's very easy said than done. If there's a lot of working together, there are so many rules over the years that I have seen Parliament overlook unless somebody rises on a point of order to challenge you know they go on because they are masters of their own rule i'm thinking that the government or the majority group are accepting accepting non-existent powers and that is why <laughs> and this is playing out that way they don't have the they don't they don't have the numbers to flex the kind of muscle that they want to flex until you appreciate this, we are not going to make any headway. And so appreciate it and begin to dialogue. In the view of the NDC, the majority is having a hangover effect of the seven parliament, which is making the NPP commit avoidable mistakes. So you see the psyche. So when the person himself is refusing to accept the reality, Obviously, that's why you're making mistakes. But it's not a hang file. Okay. You don't have the numbers. I mean, it's okay. 137, 137. Okay. They have plus one. Okay. So it's not a hang file. And I'm telling you, in Parliament, mm -hmm. even plus five doesn't give you confidence. Why? Because our constituency, the majority of ministers now come from Parliament. And they're running ministries. I've been minister before. You are, you are, there are travels, there are international meetings, sometimes in Ghana, but in your own office. Yeah. Can you leave all that and just be sitting in the house? just because of voting, or just to get government business run, if that's what they want, well, we'll prove to them that that is what will have to happen. And sometimes, me, my fear is that it's not the voting. By the time the voting finishes, it poisons the house so much so that even your general business, that will ordinarily not even, uh, an eyebrow will not be raised, will also fall victims. You, know, you have only one borrowed MP. And it's gone into your head and it's making you think that with that one borrowed MP, you can do everything. You are just deceiving yourself. Apart from the elections of the Speaker, which plunged the House into chaos, the debate over the 2022 budget and the introduction of the controversial E-Levy also led to acrimonious scenes in the Chamber. On November 26, 2021, a one-sided minority House voted to reject the 2022 budget. The rejection was occasioned after the majority caucus staged a walkout. This opened the floodgates for attacks on the speaker on the suspicion that he engaged in illegality when he allowed for the rejection of the budget, knowing that the NDC did not have the needed courage number to transact business. The conduct of the majority has been described as problematic. Executive Director of the Africa Center of Parliamentary Affairs, Dr. Rashid Roman, observed that the majority, in spite of the happenings in the chamber, must be circumspect in the handling of the speaker. 
I think uh, three years is very, very long, Parker, and I believe that uh, going forward, I would see maybe the speaker doing more of what he did the day he came back and read that speech. But I would also urge the two sides, and, and, and in this case, particularly the majority side, to be very measured in the kind of pronouncements that they make about the right honorable speaker. Because I have not seen any speaker who has been challenged in, uh, in the Fourth Republic more than this speaker within this uh, space of one year. And at the same time, once you challenge him, you say all kinds of things that are negative. The next moment you want to work with him, it becomes very difficult. He's human. But when you get to a hung parliament, political hawks have no role to play as front benches. Hawkish tendencies must be relegated to the background and bring on board people who are more mature in their thinking, in their outlook, and in their pronouncements. When you listen to some of the utterances of the current leadership in parliament, you'll be angry. Some of them are overly partisan and they sound politically nauseating to the extent that what they say frustrates any effort to build to ensure genuine consensus. In a hung parliament, it doesn't matter whether you've been a member of parliament for 20 or 30 years. If you are a political hawk, you must take the back bench and bring in people who are sober, people whose utterances would necessarily elicit a certain agreement from the other side. So political sobriety, political tempera temperament, and political tolerance are key attributes of the caliber of leaders you need to lead deliberations in a hung parliament.